So this is the ninth film in the uh, Rethinking Existentialism series. And in this film, we're going to start to think about uh, the ethics of existentialism. And so far, these films have mostly been uh, focused on the claim, the, the core claim of existentialism, that existence precedes essence, uh, uh, on the claim that you know, human existence is structured in such a way that uh, individuals don't have fixed personalities, there are no fixed characteristics of, of any particular group of people, uh, and that there's no such thing as human nature, and that instead uh, our behaviour is motivated by the reasons that we find in, in our experience, but that those reasons themselves uh, reflect um, the values that we uh, already endorse and, and, and that we can change. Um, and our focus has partly been on uh, the implications of, of that theory, uh, particularly as it's developed um, uh, in different ways by Sartre in his initial form of existentialism uh, and by Beauvoir uh, in a form of existentialism that Sartre eventually subscribes to by the end of the 1940s, uh, the start of the 1950s. We've had some impl ethical implications uh, uh, in those films, particularly in the last film, the film on Franz Fanon, uh, about race. But now um, we're going to uh, focus uh, directly on the ethical problem. Um, because the existentialism is designed as an ethical theory. That's the point of it, right? It, it, it's designed uh, as an answer to uh, what Socrates uh, identified as the, as the basic question of philosophy, which is uh, how should one live? How should we live? And that's, that's the point of existentialism. Um, uh, it's not simply an, an add-on to its core theory that it has tries to develop ethical or moral implications. Um, that's the whole motivation for looking into the structure of human existence uh, in the first place. Now, some of these ethical implications are, are psychoanalytic or psych psychiatric implications. Uh, how should one live? It's an, solely a moral question. It's also a question about how best to live, how, how to, uh, what attitudes and approaches to life are going to give you a more enjoyable life and avoid uh, the sources of distress and anxiety and despair uh, that can blight people's lives. But it also has a moral dimension. Uh, it has a dimension uh, uh, of uh, concern with um, how we should treat one another and whether there are any acceptable limits to the way in which uh, we treat one another or any limits to the acceptable ways of treating one another. Um, uh, and in, in, uh, in existentialism, the, the basic ethical idea is that there is a, a, a fundamental virtue that they call authenticity, um, and that this uh, is a, a virtue that we all ought to have. Um, so authenticity is the opposite of bad faith. Bad faith is, is often referred to by the name inauthenticity. Uh, bad faith is the, is the denial of the human condition. So bad faith uh, primarily is about um, trying to see yourself and other people as having fixed natures, as having fixed uh, essences, uh, and, and to see yourself as having a particular kind of fixed nature that you, that you, uh, that you value. Authenticity, on the other hand, is the recognition of, of the way human existence really is, or really is according to existentialism anyway. So it's um, living in, in light of the, the knowledge that existence precedes essence, um, and that, um, that, that there are no fixed essences or fixed natures, and that people's behaviour is ultimately just determined by the values that they um, endorse, and that they can change. Now, the idea that authenticity is a virtue, the idea that it is uh, a good thing to be authentic uh, for all of us and that we ought to be authentic uh, faces an immediate problem there um, because it looks like it doesn't fit with the existentialist conception of human existence. Right? So if values are just things that, we, that, we, uh, that, that are enshrined in our projects, and that the reasons that we experience in the world just reflect the values that we that we choose and that we could choose otherwise, um, then it's not clear what reason there could be for us all uh, uh, that requires us to, to embrace authenticity. 
right? What's wrong with bad faith? From the perspective of bad faith, what reason could the inauthentic person have to give up inauthenticity that requires them to give up inauthenticity in favour of authenticity? And that problem uh, is essentially, uh, I think, the existentialist form of the problem of absurdity, right? So if, if the reasons that we have are all based on our values, um, and, and, uh, and, and our values are chosen, and we can change our values, then it looks like, although we're committed to those the values that we have, and although we do recognise the reasons that we find in the world, ultimately there's no justification for that. Right? We're committed to values that we can't justify. We're committed to values that we could just swap for other values. Um, and that, as, as Simone de Beauvoir uh, brings out very clearly, I think, in, in Pyrrhus and Sinius, is, is, which is her book from 1944, um, is, uh, is, um, is, is the problem of absurdity. It's absurd to be committed to, to a value, to valuing something, when you could just give it up and uh, replace it with something else, when you've got no reason to, there's no justification for it, but nevertheless, it's a commitment. Um, and she thinks um, that it's inescapable that we're committed uh, to our values, and so does Sartre, because uh, uh, that, that's that's the core of, of existentialism. That's what it means to say existence precedes essence, that we have these values that we've chosen and that we endorse and that, we, and that we're committed to, and that those values animate our, our experience of the world as a field of reasons that we then respond to in our behaviour. So there, in essence, is the kind of problem of ethics for, for existentialists. Their conception of reasons and values looks like it entails that there's no, there could not be any reason to prefer one set of values to another. No reason to prefer one set of projects to another. Uh, because reasons are rooted in those projects in the first place. And as a result, it looks like there can be no moral constraints on behaviour at all. Right? It, it doesn't matter what set of projects you have. Right? Um, it doesn't matter whether, you're, whether, whether those projects include the project of bad faith or whether they include the project of authenticity. It can't do because um, the only reasons uh, that there could be why it would are reasons that are themselves grounded in your projects. They're not reasons that are objective. Uh, because that's not where reasons come from. The reasons that you experience in the world just reflect the values you already have. That's the problem. How can it be solved? I think there are two uh, ways of trying to solve that problem in the classic or existentialist literature of the 1940s and early 1950s. Um, and in this film, I'm going to talk about one of them, um, which is the eudaimonist uh, approach, what I call the eudaimonist approach. Um, and in uh, the next film, I'm going to talk about the more Kantian approach. Um, I think the more Kantian approach is more promising. Um, so this, this film is about, is about why eudaimonism, uh, within the context of existentialism, isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to be able to ground uh, 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 moral constraints. It's not going to be able to give us a reason to be authentic. What is eudaimonism? Eudaimonism is an approach to ethics uh, uh, which is prevalent in ancient Greek thought and has been influential uh, in Western thought ever since, which uh, focuses primarily on well-being, or what's sometimes called happiness, on living a good life, uh, which isn't necessarily the same thing as an enjoyable life, though enjoyment may be part of what makes a life a good life. So it's an approach to ethics that is primarily focused on living well. Right. Um, now, in the in the in the, the last film on, on Franz Fanon, uh, we looked at the ways in which uh, Fanon thinks that uh, inauthenticity uh, can generate um, uh, distress, uh, anxiety, uh, despair, and other kind of psychological problems. And in Fanon's analysis, what he focuses on is the way that um, those problems are generated by racism, particularly by uh, the racism that he sees engendered by colonialism. So um, uh, th those are forms of uh, racism that deem groups of people to have essential characteristics, racial characteristics. Right. Um, so groups of people uh, are, are categorized as inferior or superior and that that inferiority or superiority is an essential characteristic of the individual, one that 
the, 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 there's nothing they can do anything about. Right? It's part of their nature. Uh, as a as a white coloniser, you're part of the superior group. As a as a black uh, colonised person, you're you're part of the inferior group. And on the racist picture, that's just the way it is. On the existentialist picture, of course, there are no fixed properties. There are no fixed essences, and that's why. Uh, Fanon thinks that we can overcome that racism, or we should overcome that racism, by embracing authenticity, by um, uh, seeing the world correctly through existentialist lens, uh, of seeing individuals as uh, as having no fixed personality traits at all, um, and as a result um, of seeing uh, 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 that there is no such thing as a, an ethnic nature or a racial group uh, in that sense. Uh, and that there's no such thing uh, as essential characteristics of gender either, or, or essential characteristics of human nature. Right? Now, so that's a eudaimonist argument because he thinks that the um, racial categorizations cause distress; they cause people problems, and that um, authenticity is a way of overcoming those problems. So, as a result, life is better if you embrace authenticity. If you see. Uh, that the, this idea of essential characteristics is false, and if you, and if you, and if you work towards overcoming the uh, kind of deeply ingrained commitment to the idea of essential characteristics, so it's not just a question of changing your mind; it's a question of uh, 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 slowly kind of growing into the, the existentialist outlook by sedimenting that idea in place of the already deeply instilled idea that there are. Um, racial characteristics and that there are uh, essential properties of individuals and of groups. Now Fanon's focus, I mean Fanon as, uh, as I said, is, is, uh, is a psychiatrist, right? His focus here is on overcoming a psychiatric problem, that's his argument, right? Um, he's not trying to give us a general moral philosophy, um, so it's unfair to criticise him for not succeeding in that regard, but it is interesting that, uh, and I think important for our purposes, that, that you couldn't, um, I think, build a general moral philosophy directly out of that critique of colonialism and racism. Um, and by that I mean, look, what, what he's given us is a reason why you should embrace authenticity if you are suffering from problems which are engendered by colonialism and by racism. Um, and he focuses on the problems that these uh, that these uh, cause to black men, but he also says that they're not the only people who suffer problems as a result of colonialism and racism. Now, the shortcoming of this approach, uh, then, is that um, if you try to build a, a moral theory out of it, you're not going to succeed because it doesn't give uh, reason to embrace authenticity uh, except through uh, uh, overcoming uh, the psychic distress uh, caused by racism and colonialism. So if you're not uh, suffering from that distress to any great degree, then it looks like you don't have any reason to go through the process of um, uh, sedimenting a new way of seeing the world. Uh, and so as a result, it doesn't give us uh, what I call the imperative of authenticity. It doesn't give us a, a, a general reason why everyone ought to embrace authenticity. It, it, it simply recommends authenticity as a as a way of curing and preventing particular kinds of psychic distress that some people suffer. And that, of course, was all Fanon was trying to do. Um, Sartre, on the other hand, uh, offers a similar kind of argument where he thinks, I think, that he can offer, a, he can draw a, a moral conclusion that we all ought to um, uh, embrace authenticity. Uh, because he thinks that inauthenticity, bad faith, uh, causes a general problem for everybody who's in it, uh, regardless of their social status or, or, or other aspects of their social context. Um, and this is the problem that we looked at in, in, uh, in the film number six in this series, which is a film about his play, um, Who We Clo. Uh, this is the idea that, uh, as uh, Garcin uh, puts it in that play famously, uh, hell is other people. Right? Sartre's message here is that um, uh, relationships with other people will always be uh, tainted, will always be problematic, will always be, as he puts it, hell, if they're undertaken within the framework of inauthenticity, within the framework of bad faith, right? Because um, uh, within that framework, 
you, if you're in bad faith, are always trying to um, establish uh, a particular fixed essence, a particular fixed nature as being yours, and one that you value highly. Um, in Garson's case, he's trying to establish that he's a, a macho hero. Um, Estelle is, is trying to establish herself as a model of femininity, um, as classically understood. Um, but you are perennially under threat from the fact that other people don't necessarily see you that way. They can interpret your actions in other ways uh, and will, uh, as a result, be perpetually presenting evidence that undermines your project of trying to establish yourself as being a certain kind of person. Um, whereas you can overcome that problem, think Sartre, by embracing authenticity, right? I mean, so um, if you don't, if you're not trying to establish a particular fixed essence of yours in the first place, if all you're trying to do is pursue the particular projects that you value in clear understanding and clear knowledge that that's all there is to human existence, then uh, other people, he thinks, are not happy. Um, so he thinks that this is a, a general argument for authenticity for everybody. Why? Because it provides everybody who uh, embraces inauthenticity, everybody in bad faith, uh, is provided with a reason why they should give up that project in favour of the opposite, authenticity. So that means everybody has a reason to be authentic. The authentic people already have that reason grounded in their values, and the inauthentic people have this reason grounded in the problems that their inauthenticity generate for their relationships with other people. Um, it's kind of neat, right? Um, but again, I don't think it's enough because all it can do is provide you with one reason among, among many others. So you've got, if the argument works, I mean, forget the further question of whether actually it makes sense at all to say that bad faith necessarily uh, poisons uh, your relationships with other people in this way. But even if it does, is that enough reason to overcome the project of bad faith? Well, it looks like you've got plenty of reason uh, going the other way. For one thing, you already value that idea of yourself as having a particular fixed nature. Uh, so that gives you reason to keep on trying to establish it. Um, for another thing, it looks like once you accept the idea of sedimentation, uh, overcoming such a deeply ingrained value and such a deeply ingrained project is a, is a, is a major task. It involves time and, uh, and effort and resources. Um, it involves letting go of other things that you value. Uh, it may well involve uh, social costs because um, Sartre thinks that bad faith is, is a, a socially engendered um, a project that we're all under pressure from society to 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 endorse the value of bad faith. So you know, kind of, authenticity comes at a certain cost. You have strong reasons, therefore, already based in your existing projects, um, not not to convert from those projects to the project of authenticity. The fact that Sartre can show you that you also have a reason to do so doesn't seem to be enough. What he needs is to show that that reason is overriding, that that reason necessarily outweighs any reasons you have to continue with bad faith. And he hasn't shown that, and I don't think, I don't think he can. I think that the eudaimonist perspective, uh, as a result, um, it simply isn't going to provide us with what we need here, or it isn't going to provide existentialism with what it needs, which is which is an argument for why everybody, regardless of what their existing projects are, must embrace authenticity. Um, the best it can do, the eudaimonist approach, I think, is to uh, show that everybody has some reason to do so, to embrace authenticity, but that's not enough because the reason might be outweighed by other reasons. Okay. So that's why eudaimonism won't work. I, I said earlier that there are two approaches in the, in the existentialist literature of the 1940s and 1950s to uh, establishing the virtue of authenticity. That's one of them. And uh, as I say, I think that it essentially can't work because the best it can do is provide a reason for authenticity, not an overriding reason. Um, the other approach is the more Kantian approach that is found in uh, Simone de Beauvoir's essay uh, Pyrrhus and Sinius, which she first published in 1944, um, and that argues not on the basis of our existing projects themselves, right? it's not trying to show that the project of bad faith uh, generates problems for us that we 
that we want to solve, but rather tries to show that as a result of having the kind of existence that we have, as a result of, of the fact that your existence precedes your essence, you are under an obligation to recognise and value that freedom in yourself and other people. And I will explain that argument in the next film.